Welcome to the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast. In this podcast, we cover all topics on how to grow your B2B SaaS, no matter in which stage you're in. I'm Jorn Hoffman, the host of this show and the founder of Redditus, which is a B2B SaaS that helps other B2B SaaS companies to set up, manage, and grow an affiliate program. Being a founder myself means I'm going to the exact same journey as you are, experiencing the exact same issues, and probably have the exact same questions. And this is why I started the podcast in the first place, get advice from industry experts on how to grow my B2B SaaS. So if you like this content, make sure to describe, follow, give it a thumbs up. Let's just dive in. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to scale to 1 million MOR quickly. My guest is Matt Wolach. Matt is a founder, investor, mentor, coach, podcast host, and he filled roles like VP of sales, CEO, CRO, director of sales and marketing. So he definitely has a diverse background and seen probably everything on the business side. With his podcast, Skill Your SaaS and his role as a B2B SaaS sales coach at Sellers, he helps software businesses understand how to sell more, generate more leads and close more deals to scale to that 1 million MOR mark. And that is what we're going to dive in today. Happy to have you on the show, Matt. Yeah, thanks for being here, Jorn. I'm really excited for this. Likewise. And if people are not convinced after this intro, why should people listen to you today? I've spent years trying to figure out exactly how to sell my own businesses. And in fact, in my early days, I struggled a lot. It was rough. I was thrown into sales of a software company because as a partnership, I was the one responsible for marketing and sales. I was really confident about it going in and that confidence was shattered as I could not figure out how to generate leads. I could not close leads and it was really frustrating for me, but I wasn't going to stop there. I sweated and spent lots of time trying to learn exactly the way it would work and how it would happen and how we need to get deals in and eventually made it happen. It took a few years, but that company took off and eventually we were able to exit that company for quite a bit of money. Did it again, started a new company, put the same process in place, except now that I had the process, it went a lot faster, which was great. And so that one exited in quite a bit shorter time. But now I have clients around the world in about 50 different countries who use my process that they're getting great results with. And I guess that's why they listen to me is because I've been there, done that. I've been through the struggle and now I've seen exactly what works well to sell software. I think it's nice that you really experience the mistakes, you really experience the struggles and you create processes out of that. So we're going to dive in that in a sec. We're first going to cover some basics in a way. The topic here today is like how to scale to 1 million MOR, right? What in minimum needs to be in place to even think about scaling to 1 million MOR? In order to get to a million, you've got to be able to have process. A million MRR, that means you're about 12 million a year, not about, that is what it is which means at that point, you've got to have process in place. And this is a big learning for a lot of people is a lot of things are haphazard early. If you don't have a very structured, clean process throughout your entire funnel, it's going to be very difficult. Nice. And before we dive into mistakes, best practices, processes, is there anything else we need to know before we really dive into that section? Is there something like you need to have this, you need to know this before we can even talk about how to scale? One of the things that I teach with my clients is the mental shift. And one of the things that we talk about, of course, if you're like, oh, I got this software, I need to sell it. I need to get customers. I need to close deals. I need to sell. But actually, if we think sell, or a prospect starts to feel yucky and they don't like being sold to. Nobody likes getting sold to. So it feels yucky. And even you doing it, you might feel yucky yourself. And so one of the things I guess we need to understand here is let's have a mental shift. Let's shift from I need to sell to I need to help. How can I help these people? There's people out there with problems. You have a product that's going to help those problems. So shift from I need to sell them to I need to help these people. And if I can help them, then obviously they're going to be buying the product. And it's so funny when I get my clients to make this transformation, they go from being that icky, yucky salesperson to being a guide and a consultant that people are drawn to and attracted to. And it's so funny how much they start closing deals more often when that happens. So don't sell, help. Yeah. Because in the end, if you help them to solve the problem, they will stick with you longer because you actually help them to solve that problem. We're going to dive into that more deeper. So probably this is already one of the mistakes companies make scaling their SaaS, right? Trying to sell instead of actually solving the problem. Any other common mistakes companies make? Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes companies make is they look at their, when you're just launching especially, and they say, okay, we have this product we built, great tool. We need to get a ton of leads in here. 
And so they go out and they work on marketing. They do some great things. They generate leads, but then they realize we don't know how to close these leads. We've talked to a few people and none of them are signing up. Why is that? And you realize, uh uh-oh, we spent all this time and effort and money on marketing. And now we don't have a sales process or a closing process. And we don't know what we're doing. And we're losing all that time and effort and money that we just spent on marketing. And so actually the order that the best companies are doing is they're figuring out how are we going to close the people we're talking to? How are we going to convince these people that this is the right thing for them and they're going to be much further ahead using this product than otherwise? And then once we have that sales process, that closing process, the demo process even, now we feel good about that if somebody is going to talk to us, we have a high likelihood of them actually signing up. Now let's go out and let's get deals done. Let's get things closed. One of my clients, Paul, this is a perfect example. They're like, we need leads, we need leads. And I said, hold on maybe we actually need to close. And so we worked on the closing process. We implemented some demo structure. We implemented even some process after the demo. And they went from a 26% close rate to an 87% close rate. And once they reached that, they're like, okay, almost nine out of every 10 people we're talking to sign up for us. Now we feel good about, let's go out, let's market, let's spend some money, let's spend some time and generate leads because we know they're going to close. It makes the dynamics, it makes... All of your metrics look really good once you understand how to close because you can spend a lot on marketing and make things happen. Yeah, and as you mentioned, if you dive into the metrics, you don't always need more leads. If you just close, I guess, what you already have, then you don't need to scale that much in in that sense. And I follow you, of course, and I would recommend everybody to follow you on LinkedIn. You have your own YouTube channel. I think one of your posts was also not creating enough pain in the discovery phase. Can you tell a bit more about that? This is absolutely a major problem that most people have. And in fact, I was just talking with one of my clients literally earlier today about this, and he's struggling on how to do this. Even though he knows conceptually the right thing, he's trying to put it in place. And we we just clicked today. You could see a light bulb go off with him. And he knew he had it. He said, I'm so giddy because I can't wait for my next call to use this tactic you just taught me. I need to make this happen. If you think about it, buyers, if if it's the right product, they should want to get started right away. If it's something that's going to actually solve their problems and help them, they shouldn't wait weeks or months. It should be something that they get started with right away. But so many times we have a buyer who waits and it delays the, the process. and The sales cycle gets really long. It's really frustrating. And so we need to understand how to get them to take action quickly, how to get them to say, I need this. And so many times we think, oh, but my product's not perfect and it might be missing this or they might not love this part of it, even though I like this part's not great. And we get too stuck on, they're not going to like us because the product's a little off. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter how great your product is. You don't have to have an awesome product to be able to sell. I've seen it over and over how sometimes the best products don't win. I've got lots of clients who are on the brink of destruction and I look at their product and it's amazing but they're missing out on marketing and sales tactics. And one of these things we can do is have an awesome discovery process. If you put a great discovery process in place, then your buyer will feel like I've got to get started right now. Let's say you're crawling through a desert and it's dry, it's hot, the sun is beating down on you, sand everywhere for miles, and you're just crawling and crawling, it's horrible, and you feel like you're gonna die. You've got major problems. You are very dehydrated, you feel like it's about over. If somebody came up to you and they rode up on a horse and they're like, hey, you look like you're in bad shape. Do you want some water? You Would you stop and say, wait, hold on. Is that filtered water? Is that mountain spring water? Is, is that Avion? That's all I drink. So I've got to make sure. No. You say, yeah, give me the water. I need the water right now. You don't care what kind of water it is. And that's exactly what happens with your product. If you can get your buyer to realize that they're in really bad shape, and they've got to fix their challenges right now or they're in trouble, then they don't care that your product might not have this perfect thing or it might look a little weird. They're going to need, give me the product. I need it right now. Let's go. And so one of my clients, Greg, is a perfect example of this. He came to me at a 1.9% close rate, 1.9%. If you can only imagine closing two out of a hundred demos, that you'd be very frustrated. He said, you're, you're my last chance. If you can't help me out, it's over. I'm shutting it down. I taught him this process. I taught him how to get people really emotional in discovery and get them realizing I'm really hurting. I need a solution right now. And he did it and it worked. And he came back to me, he said, Matt, We're now over 30% on our close rate. And even better, 
people are 90% closed before they ever see the product. I get them so emotional and so worked up about their problems during the discovery process that they think I've just got to have it. Oh, you have something that does this. Let me see. Okay, cool. That's great. Let's go. And they don't even care. He shows the product for a few minutes and it's over. He's closing people with only showing his product for a couple minutes. If you can get people to hate their problem and know they need to switch right now, they're in. So figure out how to get your discovery just right so that they're emotional and they hate their problem. And that's the biggest lesson, Joran. Love it. I'm still thinking about somebody crawling in the desert right now. But if you would take the client example, right? What kind of process or for the people listening right now, and every business is going to be different, of course, and like creating the problem is probably going to be somewhat different as well. But is there some kind of process they can follow where they can have them hate the problem and make sure that they can start also having these close rates? Great question. So for this, I use my knife analogy. So I have a knife analogy that makes it really easy to understand how to do this. And basically, from my experience of working with thousands of different companies and thousands of different sellers, I've identified people who are selling into three different categories. You've got the entry-level people who just got started, and you've got the middle people, and then you've got the experts. Now, the entry-level people, let's say you have a buyer who comes to you. And the buyer comes to you and says, hey, my shoulder hurts. I need you to fix it. Now, obviously, we're not doctors. It's just an analogy. But anyway, they come to you and say, my shoulder hurts. So you look at that and you say, okay, they said the shoulder hurts. Internally, you might think, yeah, the shoulder hurts. He's telling me that. But I'm looking and I see a knife in their belly. They literally have a knife sticking into them. And so that initial salesperson, the early person that's kind of entry level, they're going to realize there's a knife. But then they also say, they just told me to fix the shoulder. So I'm just going to tell them how to fix the shoulder. Let's do that. And the problem is that buyer, they might have said that the shoulder is a little bit pained, but their major problem wasn't solved. You weren't focusing on something that's actually really important. So that's a problem. This next level buyer, the mid-level, they go to the next step and they realize, okay, you said the shoulder, but I've identified the knife. Now, this person at least understands I need them to identify that they have another problem, that they have a bigger problem. And so what the next level seller does is they say, hey, yeah, your shoulder, I, I, I get that might be hurting, but you have a knife in your gut. And at that point, they say, oh, so I do. Thanks for pointing that out. That mid-level seller says, great, I got them to identify what the real problem is. But then they stop there. And in fact, in many cases, that mid-level seller wants to pull it out. Our product solves it because it can do this. And there's a cool report and it's got a drop down. It's amazing. Don't do that. Don't sell in discovery. We need them to go deeper than just identifying their problem. We need the buyer to go further than just realizing that's a thing. That's what most people do who've been around sales for a while because you will close some deals. You're going to close some. But if you want them to close fast and if you want to close a lot of deals, like a lot, like more than 50% of your closes or of your total demos, then we need to go to the next level. And the next level, the third level seller, they recognize that there's a problem other than what the buyer thinks. They get the buyer to identify it. But instead of pulling the knife out, they do something else. They twist the knife. They get the buyer to realize just how bad the pain is. Now, I know you're in, there's people out there going, he said, twist the knife. He's hurting his prospect. He's a terrible salesperson. This is why sales is bad. Why I hate sales. Nope. This is an analogy. Please don't take me for that. We're not inventing new pain. We're just getting the buyer to realize that they have a pain that they didn't know about. So we twist the knife so that they realize, oh, that's even worse than I thought. Holy cow. That is terrible. I need to fix that. And I need to fix it now because this sucks. I hate it. And so by twisting the knife, instead of pulling it out and trying to be the hero, we get them to understand just how deep the pain goes. And so how do you twist the knife? You ask them questions to get that understanding. Hey, so where would you be if you didn't have this? And what does this mean to you personally? And even doing calculations. So wait, you told me that you're missing out on this and this. And if I run the numbers, that means you're missing $12,000 per month. Is that what you just told 12,000 a month you're losing just on this little thing and going that deep, getting them to fully understand. Yeah, I guess it is. I didn't, I never calculated it. By the way, you'll be a consultant to them at that point. Once you start calculating things for them and they're going to trust you and believe in you. And once they realize that's how bad it is and they already trust you. Great. Yeah. Show me what we got here. And so it's a pretty incredible how you can get them to make that shift from, yeah, here's some of my problems to, holy cow, we're in trouble. We need a solution now by just 
twisting the knife. Then you will be the hero when you pull the knife out in the demo and you explain during your demo exactly how they're going to remove the knife and they're going to be much, much better. By the way, only about 3% of sellers know how to do this. If you can do this, you will be an elite seller. You will get to that third tier and become one of those people that has insane close rates. Like my client, Mike, who closes at 71%. He closes seven out of 10 of his demos because he's so good at twisting the knife. This is the way to do it, Joran. Nice. Two things like a discovery and then demo, you took them apart. You also mentioned one of your clients only does three minutes of sharing his screen. Do you recommend all this discovery without showing the product or maybe for three minutes and then booking another call to have a demo? Is that best practice for you? It actually depends. It depends on a lot of different factors, whether you keep your demo and discovery together in one call or you split it up into separate calls. So there's no one answer. The depending points are price point, complexity of the product, how the prospects even got to you, whether it's cold or whether they're warm or there's all kinds of different factors we look at. But once I start working with clients, we can look at those factors and make a recommendation on what would be best for them. And then one other question I had, like you, you mentioned, ask a lot of questions, right? Have them realize that they have a pain and, and twist that knife. Would you, would you see a lot that people are not comfortable asking all these questions? Because it's kind of always feel like an interrogation, right? Where you just keep asking questions and then at one point there's no, you don't get the answers you're looking for. Like how would you help uh, people to overcome that? What would you recommend? You're exactly right. It, it is uncomfortable for many and especially for me. So I came into sales from a customer service background and that customer service background, it was drilled into us that the customer is always right. And we did whatever we could to make sure the customer felt great. And we didn't upset them. Throw all that out the window for sales. The customer is not always right. They're wrong. In fact, they're wrong and they feel that they're wrong. And that's why they're coming to you to help them figure out what's wrong and how they can solve it. People go to Reddit because they need to set up a program so they can start getting more leads in. They can get people to send leads to them. They don't know how to do that. And your product helps them great for that. They need that help. But if they went and told you something that was wrong, we shouldn't say, oh, that's okay. We should react and let them know, ooh, that's really what's going on. Oh, we need to fix that so that they know. And so, so many times it hurt me early in my sales career because I was like, that's okay. No worries. It's fine. And people didn't realize how bad their situation was. Once I realized we need to twist the knife, then I could say, oh, really? So you're losing a million dollars a quarter? Now I'm challenging them. And I'm getting them to understand that things are bad. And that's a shift. It's a shift away from what we've been taught. And that's why a lot of people struggle at selling. That's why a lot of people come to me to fix selling because they don't know the right way to do it because it's not intuitive. Sales is not something that you can just naturally pick up. Good sales, great sales is something that you have to learn how to do because it, it doesn't just come to you. And that's why I struggled so much at the beginning. And I think this is goes really well into the next question I have. I think that's one of the challenges people have before they uh, implement the mental shift, but what kinds of challenges will people have when they actually think, okay, yeah, I definitely need to twist the knife uh, to keep an analogy. What are challenges will they run into? Cause it's not going to be perfect from day one, right? So mm -hmm. what are the things they're going to encounter and what kind of recommendations would you have to overcome those? Yeah. Great question. So once they learn that twisting the knife is the right thing, the next step is where do we do it and how do we do it? And what you want to do is actually craft your process so that those opportunities to twist the knife happen on each call. So we want to actually put it in place. For an example, one of my clients, he sells this kind of, it's like a financial electronic medical record type thing that helps people understand. Well, basically what he would do is he would ask them specifically, so how much are you getting here and how many clients are you winning there? And he would actually dive into that. And he said, but wait, how many should you be at? Where should it be? And they told him the goals. And he said, so you're missing this much. You're losing this much. And so if you think about your prospects, the power of something negative, something lost is actually twice as powerful emotionally as something they could gain. So he did a beautiful job because instead of saying, oh, so you're wanting to actually add this and get to this number, he's saying, you should be there. You're losing it. You're missing out on that. And by doing that, it got the buyers to realize not, oh, I could gain this. Let's see. I'm not sure if it'll work for us. Maybe I could. No, I'm missing this. I'm losing this. I need something to solve that. So you're exactly right. You're in it. It's hard to know when to do it until you build in the, the process, until you build into the process exactly where you plan on twisting the knife 
and you should know your buyers. You should know what's going wrong. So one example, one thing that that people at home can do, something that really works. Instead of asking just only standard questions like, oh, how many users do you have? How many locations? That's good. You do need to get that. But let's go deeper. Let's have questions that we know we're going to get good answers to. And by no, it means you have to know your market. Get to know your market. You should know their buyers. You should know what they suck at. You should know what they're missing. And you should know that your product is solving those things. And so based on what your product does and those gaps your product fills, ask those questions. Ask them. So Joran, you might ask, hey, so tell me about your affiliate process that you have outlined. Oh, we don't really have an affiliate process. You probably know that a lot of people don't have a good process. So ask that. Don't say you probably don't have a good process. Now, it doesn't sound... That sounds like you're being a salesperson. But ask, hey, can you outline me your affiliate process right now as you have it? We don't really have... You don't have one set up at all? And right now they're freaking out. Oh, I should. I guess we should have. I should have done that. Dang it. I need something that's going to do that for me. And now it becomes easy to get them to realize, uh oh, I need this knife out of here. This thing sucks. Pull it out. Help me out. And that's what we need to do is we need to dynamically build out the discovery process more than just, oh, I got my questions. We're good to go. No, let's make sure we understand exactly where we're going to twist the knife so we can get people feeling bad and we can get them helped out. This podcast episode is sponsored by Redditus. Redditus helps B2B SaaS companies to set up, manage, and grow an affiliate program. In short, it means you're asking other people, affiliates, to promote your SaaS. You would only pay the affiliates a kickback fee when they deliver you paid clients, making it a very cost-effective and scalable way to grow your MRR. See more at getreditus.com. One question I had though is, I really like the idea of losing out on something we'll close a lot more. Would you recommend also, because now just talking about the sales process, right? The calls you have with clients. Should this also come into all the marketing materials you have, website, ads, etc.? Yes, absolutely. I actually have a friend who did some tests on Twitter. And on Twitter, he would post one thing that say, oh, this and talking about a gain that could happen. And then he did the opposite a couple of weeks later and posting basically the same exact thing but talking about what's being lost and the, the loss that people are experiencing. And the lost one got so much more engagement and people were so much more emotional about it. And so through your website, it should be designed at, hey, what are you missing? What are you losing out on? What's not there that you don't have right now? Instead of, oh, you could possibly gain this. People are much more worried about things they could lose or that they're missing than something they might be able to add. And it's also hard to convince people that if you use this product, you're going to add this thing. You're going to be able to get to this new level. They're like, I'm working hard right now. Are you sure? I'm? Is it going to help me get to that? Am I really going to get more leads? Am I really going to get more revenue? As opposed to you are doing the wrong process and you're missing leads that you should have gotten. People came to your site and they didn't convert because you didn't have the right way to do it. That's scarier and something that feels like I could just fix that and plug that hole. So absolutely focus on what's the miss, what's the loss, as opposed to what could they gain. And I think a lot of companies don't do it, including ourselves. Like we definitely have the gaining part, but then I fully understand what you're saying. As in people think, oh yeah, can I actually reach it versus I'm losing out on something. It's more of a nice to have, maybe now even, where they're not actually having the feeling that they're losing out on something. Like I, I can already see it in our own messaging. Good, good. Yeah, I hope it helps. If we, I guess, look at you work with a lot of clients, right? Any other best practices on what SaaS companies do really well, which helps them to grow quicker towards that 1 million MRR? The biggest thing is continual training with the team. If you're going to get to a million MRR, you're going to have a team to do it. It's not one person that's going to be doing that. And so making sure the whole team is on the same page, making sure everybody's consistent. One of the things I do is what's called a sales process audit. And essentially, that's where management hires me. I go in and I basically mystery shop the sales team. And I submit leads. And we see how long does it take them to contact me? How long does it take them to set up a demo? How hard do they try to set up a demo? If I don't show up, do they try to get me back? What do they say on the discovery call? What do they say on the demo? How good are they at closing? What are the what are they sending me in terms of quotes? You would not believe how inconsistent even small sales teams are. Even small sales teams of three or four people are the reps are sending quotes vastly different than each other, even for the same size deal. The reps will tell you different numbers based on, oh yeah, we have this or that. I had one client that had four reps 
And they had a team that was doing some work as kind of a SaaS service combo. And one person said there were 15 of those team members. One said there were 22. One said there was 37. And one said 53. And so even between four reps, they all had different numbers that they were spouting out. And if it's going to be that variable on something as easy as the number of people on the team, then it's going to be variable on everything else. And that variability creates inconsistencies which will mean some people are going to close, some people are not. And that's bad. If you're spending that money and sales reps are very expensive, we need them all raised very high levels. We need them to all close really well. It's pretty incredible what some of these people say on these calls. I'm having people tell me all kinds of bad things about the company. I have people say things you should never say to a prospect, things like, oh yeah, I guess we harassed you. Meaning like our team got you on a call. Please don't say that. I've had people say, oh, I'll sell you anything you want to buy. Don't say that. That's very salesy. That doesn't, you're not taking care of their needs specifically. You're just hoping they buy something. That's definitely not good. And when I present this to management, they're blown away. They're always like, what? That's nothing like what we told them. And so sometimes we feel like, oh yeah, we've told them they got to do this. Guess what? Things happen. Reps are busy. They don't always learn it the right way. They don't always learn it the first time. They don't always implement it. We've got to double check. We've got to follow up. We've got to make sure the team is on the same path. We've got to keep that team aligned in terms of what's being said and how it's being said. And these audits produce some pretty incredible things, but they also produce great results. One of my clients, Elaine, she went through an audit. They were at 11% on their close rate. 11% was the average amongst six reps. They're now at 39% on their close rate. And in fact, it's trending up. And so understanding exactly what the misses are and where the inconsistencies are, and then how to get the team all on the same page produces some pretty incredible results. Yeah, because 11% for six salespeople going to 39, that's going to be a good... They actually quadrupled revenue. Yeah, nice. And talking about like metrics, you built a SaaS metric tracker document. Tell me a bit more about that. And then what metrics does it actually track? So I guess also the question is like, what metrics a SaaS company should track in your opinion? Yeah, good question. First, the document, it's called the SaaS sales scorecard and you can get it at sassalesscorecard.com. And I built it because I didn't have a great way to track my own metrics. Yeah, you've got your CRM and that's nice. It, I never really could get it all organized neatly and perfectly right in front of me. So I built it for me first. And then I gave it to a friend because he said, hey, how do you track? I'm like, here, try this. And another friend and they're all like, this is great. We love it. And so I created it so that everybody can just have it. So sassalescorecard.com, go download it. But essentially it's it's going to give you an opportunity to just put in what your number's worth for the month. And it automatically calculates all the most important SaaS metrics. And it also gives you graphs. It shows you trend lines. But then what I also did is I put goals in and benchmarks for what you should be at. So the benchmarks show you based on some of the top companies where you should be for each of those metrics. Your goal, you can put in your own goal and it'll track how you're doing against the goal and against the benchmark. It's pretty fun. But essentially some of the metrics we need to track, things like your lifetime value. That means if you sell a customer, what are they going to be worth to you over the course of their entire membership with you? And then of course you have your CAC, your customer acquisition cost. What does it cost you to acquire a customer? Now, I'm sure you know, Yarn. It's wild how many companies don't calculate their CAC. They don't know how much it costs them to acquire a customer. I was talking with a client and I said, hey, here's a lead source. It's one of those like software advice, G2 type things where every lead that they send you is going to be about $200. They're going to charge you $200 to send that lead to you. My client was like, no way, we're not paying $200. I'm like, wait, hold on. What's your current CAC? And he had to go in there, run some numbers, went through. He's like, oh, we're at $575. They're spending $575 for every client. Their close rate is about 50% because we worked on that, which means that it would take them two of these leads to close one deal, which means it would only be $400 for this lead source to get a client that's less than 575. So knowing your numbers helps you make better decisions. They were able to understand that actually it sounds expensive, but it's better than what we're doing right now. Let's do it. And so they did it and they're taking off. It's going really well. But understanding that is important. Now, combining those two numbers we just mentioned, lifetime value and customer acquisition cost. There's a ratio called your LTV to CAC. Your LTV to CAC refers to how much is the lifetime value versus the customer acquisition cost we're, we're, we're spending. So let's say it costs you $1,000 per customer to acquire that customer, $1,000. If it's $1,000 per customer to acquire them, how much are they giving you over time and how much you're going to get over the entire lifetime for that customer? 
And let's say they're at a hundred bucks a month and they stay with you for a year. They're a hundred bucks a month. They stay with you for a year. That's $1,200. That means 1,200, you spent a thousand. It's just barely more than one, one to one. Yes, you made a little bit of profit. It's not great. What we want in our LTV to CAC is we want a three to one ratio. Three to one would be the minimum, meaning I spend $1, I get $3 back or three euro. So if that's the case, that's a good investment. If I told you, hey, if you spend one euro and you get three back, how many do you want to spend? Look, let's keep going. I get three back for every one I spend. Great. That's a good investment. So if your LTV to CAC is three to one or more, that's really good. However, we don't want it to get too high. I had one client, they were at 29 to one. We got their sales closing process like so dialed in that their Elf TV to CAC went to 29 to one, meaning they spend $1 on marketing, they get 29 back. They were just crushing it. But what that actually means is now we have an opportunity. If we get above say six to one, once we get up there, now our marketing is working really well. Our closing process is working really well. So let's spend more money. Let's put some more effort into marketing and get more leads in because we know that we're going to be able to close them. So that's where, again, knowing your numbers either tells you this is something that is imbalanced on the bad end. We have too low of an LTV to CAC or we've got a great LTV to CAC. Let's spend some marketing. Let's make it happen. And once you understand the metrics and the numbers, it makes it so easy to make the right decisions. It all starts with that. Otherwise, you can't make the, the right decisions, right? They have to be dated. Like LTV CAC ratio, it's, I think, one of the most important metrics for sure. You hear now people discussing, like, should we actually focus on payback period rather than LTV CAC? What is your opinion there? Yeah, payback period is also important. So we call that CAC payback. So if you spend that thousand, how long is it going to take for you to recoup that? If they pay you a hundred bucks a month and you spent a thousand, it's going to take you 10 months to get that money back. Now, if your lifetime ratio with your customer is very high, they're with you for three years or more, then you're okay spending 10 months worth of a customer to get them because they're going to be with you for three or four years and it's going to be great. And so your CAC payback period refers to how many months does it take to get the money back that you spent based on the amount of money they're going to pay you per month. If you're less than 12 months, that's considered good. So sometimes people are like, wait, I'm not spending $1,000 to get a $100 customer. Hold on. How long are they with you? They're with me for three years. Why not? They're going to be with you for that long on average. Yeah, you might have one or two that leaves after three months or so. But if most of them are going to stay for a long time, then that's a good inv investment. Especially when you're talking to investors, VCs, funders, private equity. That's one thing they look at is if something gets invested into acquiring customers, how quickly can you get it back? So the shorter the CAC pay period, the better. Once you get above a year, it starts to get a little scary. So you want to try and keep that low. Yeah, because in the end, they want to invest money to accelerate growth. So you need to have those numbers in place to actually show that the money they invest is going to turn into the multipliers you just mentioned. Exactly. Nice. We're going to dive into the final four questions. So when we talk about scaling your SaaS, what kind of advice would you give somebody who's just starting out and growing to 10K monthly recurring revenue? So I think in the early days, the biggest focus needs to be on the customer. The ones that I see struggle are the ones who don't truly know their market. On my own show, Scale Your SaaS, where I interview software founders as well like you, we talk about what is your biggest thing that you learned in your early days? And almost all of them say, I'm so glad I got to know my customers. The ones who are successful, they have tons of conversations. And I've landed it. You need at least 25 to 50 customer conversations, not sales conversations, but purely just ask them, what are you struggling with? What keeps you up at night? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you hope to gain? And really just understanding what they're going through. And you're going to start to see patterns after 25 or 50. And once you see those patterns, it makes it easier to develop your product to match that market and what their needs are. It makes it easier to set up your marketing messaging and all of your funnels so that you can get that to align with their needs and how they work. And you can make sure your sales process and your sales scripts align with your market really well. It just creates so much value for you to know inside and out all about your prospects, your market and what they need. Yeah, and exactly the, the pain they're having to make sure you can add it on, on the website as mentioned. Nice. If we go past the 10K MRR and we're going to make a big jump, we're going to go to 10 million ARR. What kind of advice would you give SaaS founders here? Let's say you're going to that from that 10K to 10 million. You've got to have all sorts of process in place. You need marketing processes. You need your sales processes. You need your team processes. It can't happen without that. And I can't tell you how many clients I take on in the three to 4 million range. 
and they're just all over the place, very scattered. And they don't have process for this. They don't have process for that. And they admit it. They realize it. And that's what happens when you grow quickly. Oh, we just through brute force and effort just made it happen. But in order to really get to that 10, you have to have the process and the structure laid out so you know exactly what's going on here. So anybody you hire knows exactly what's going on at each phase. And it makes it simple to plug people in and they can take off and they can be excellent at what they're doing. Process is king getting to 10 million. And it will break a couple of times. Like I, I was head of customer success in my previous job. I always hated processes myself in previous companies. In the end, I was the one building them for the CS department. But once you start scaling, they will break because what you think is working at a certain revenue stage is going to break when you have more people, more revenue coming in. So true. So true. If we zoom out a bit, is there any general advice you want to give towards SaaS founders who are currently on their journey and I guess no revenue metric related to it? Any advice you want to give here? I think the biggest advice is always be thinking about what you can do to help your target buyers. So make your product something that's going to be very buyer focused, something that's great for them. Align your sales efforts towards that. Make sure that your entire team knows that their goal is to get your people to be better, get your market, your targets to be better off. Through interaction with you, they should be far improved than if they did anything else. And if we have that mindset of we're helping and we're improving people, then they're going to see you as advisors. They're going to see you as consultants, not somebody trying to sell them some product. You're going to be an advisor. And yes, sometimes that means that you might advise them to go do something else, that maybe they'll get better benefit. By the way, I have gotten many referrals from people I've turned away because I thought that they would have a better chance of succeeding elsewhere than others because they realize, holy cow, that person actually cares about helping me. Maybe there's somebody else I can help them with. Oh, meet my friend, Mike. And it's incredible how many times they feel almost obligated to put you in front of somebody else because now they trust you so much and they believe in you and they're grateful to you for helping them. And if we can get our entire team, and including ourselves, making sure we believe it, let's help these people. Let's get them the results they need. Then that's going to pay all sorts of dividends for you and your company going forward. Yeah. And even for the employees, if you are paid to help people and you can be genuine and you can actually help them, then I think it's going to be a really fulfilling job as well, which you're going to do. Totally agree. Cool. Then final question. What is one thing you wish you knew 10 years ago? I think the thing I wish I knew 10 years ago was it, it would be the power of the personal brand. Uh, I didn't start building my personal brand until about four years ago. I was really focused on my company brands before that. Something that I've known for a while, but didn't really apply it would be people buy from people. And so building a company brand is much, much harder than getting people to connect with another person. And a perfect example, of course, Tesla has 10 million followers. Elon has 150 million followers. It's completely a different dynamic. So understanding that took me a while. But once I built it, it started working. My personal brand, you mentioned, I've got my YouTube, I've got all my channels. There's 60 or 70,000 people who follow me across all these different channels. And we get all sorts of inbound business from it. It's amazing. But I didn't understand that. I didn't get that. And it took me quite a while. If somebody else is out there thinking, how do I do this? Build your personal brand, be a thought leader, share values, speak about and, and post all about how other people can be helped. And when they get help from you, they're going to say, that's great. I might need to know more from this person. Just like Joran's doing right now with these podcasts. These are super helpful. He's got an amazing lineup and people realize that this guy wants to help and you can go to him for what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to add one thing to it, like I don't have all the expertise myself. So what I do is I basically ask people like Matt to come onto the show and share their expertise. And I think when you're in this flow, having amazing guests, it's a lot easier to keep the flow high for amazing guests. So you need to start somewhere, but once it starts picking up, then you can continue on the flow you have. Perfectly said. Nice. We're going to uh, link to your SaaS sales scorecard. We're going to link to your podcast, Skill Your SaaS. And I will add a link to the podcast we did together on it. Add a link to your LinkedIn yeah. profile, to YouTube. But if people want to get in contact with you, like you mentioned, you're on all these channels. What is the best way to do? LinkedIn is probably the best. I'm very active on there. In fact, I post a, a tip every day. So if you're wanting tips on how to scale, go follow me on LinkedIn, Matt Wallach, W-O-L-A-C-H. And you'll get tips on how to grow, how to scale. Nice. 
Thank you for coming on. For people listening, we're going to add a poll on Spotify. So make sure you answer that. And if you haven't done so, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts so we can grow this podcast even further. Thanks again for coming on, Matt. Thank you. It was a lot of fun, Joran. Cheers. Thank you for watching this show of the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast. You made it till the end, so I think we can assume you like this content. If you did, uh, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you like this content, feel free to reach out if you want to sponsor the show. If you have a specific guest in mind, if you have a specific topic you want us to cover, reach out to me on LinkedIn. More than happy to take a look at it. If you want to know more about Redditus, uh, feel free to reach out as well. But for now, have a great day and good luck growing your B2B SaaS.